The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was a civil rights organization established by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1957 to assist and coordinate with local organizations in their fight for full equality for African Americans in the United States. And if this is the type of content that you enjoy, you can find more content like this at OneMikeHistory.com. Also, if you'd like to support the channel, you can do so at my Buy Me Coffee or my Patreon page in the description below. Give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. But without further ado, let's get started. January 10th, 1957, following the Montgomery bus boycott, Bayard Rustin invited 60 black ministers and leaders to Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. Their goal was to form an organization to coordinate and support nonviolent action against desegregation of bus systems across the South. Bayard Rustin first conceived this idea in his experiences with the Congress for Racial Equality. CORE was an interracial organization and it was founded in 1942. Bayard Rustin concluded that blacks would not be attracted to an interracial pacifist organization ran by a mostly white leadership where core had failed to win a mass following the montgomery bus boycott had provided concrete evidence that the greatest strength of the Montgomery boycott was that the black community organized it themselves there would be two principles that they would deploy voting power and direct action there would be an extensive effort to increase the black voter registration across the south however until african americans could vote in a large scale they conceived that direct action would be their primary political weapon rustin states that the montgomery bus boycott showed that the center of gravity had shifted from the courts to community action and that leaders should realize that people not simply lawyers could win their own freedom so initially rustin sought tk steel a preacher and a civil rights activist and the main organizer of the 19 1956 Tallahassee bus boycott to take a central role in the new organization, but still would decline. He told Rustin that he would be happy though to join a new organization if he sought out Martin Luther King for that role. So King, Rustin, Ella Baker, Thiel were joined by Fred Shuttlesworth, Joseph Lowry, and Ralph Abernathy. The new organization would continue their meeting until January 11th, where they called themselves the Southern Negro Leaders Conference on Transportation and Nonviolent Integration. Although the title encompassed transportation, Rustin's agenda was to sweep wide. True bus integration across the South was their initial focus, but one principal lesson that was stressed is that bus companies were not willing to lose money in support of segregation. February 15th, a follow-up meeting happened in New Orleans and the new organization elected Martin Luther King as their president. Then they changed the names used from the initial meetings to the Negro Leaders Conference for Nonviolent Integration and then Southern Negro Leadership Conference. It wasn't until the third meeting in August of 1957 that the group settled on Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The decision to include Christian in their name was not taken lightly. The SELC founders were ministers and the manifesto stressed the fact that the new organization was guided by Christian principles. This name also expanded on their focus beyond busing to end all forms of segregation. And with that, they formed a small office established in the Prince Hall Masonic Temple building in Atlanta and Ella Baker for a long time was their first and only staff member. The SELC created an election board and established an organization of local affiliate organizations. Most of them were either churches or community organizations like the Montgomery Improvement Association or the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. This organizational structure was a bit different from the NAACP or even the Congress for Racial Equality because the SELC had confined themselves primarily to the South and they didn't accept individual memberships. Because of this, the SELC did not enjoy the steady stream of income from subscriptions like an organization like the NAACP did. Additionally, the SELC took great pains to avoid the impression that they were attempting to supplant the NAACP. They sought active cooperation from the NAACP in their efforts. While the NAACP initially perceived the SELC as an unwelcome competitor and a threat to their southern base, however, after Brown versus the Board of Education, the NAACP experienced a lot of southern harassment and with the NAACP out of action, in a lot of states, there was a need for an obvious alternative. While the Southern Christian Leadership Conference may have benefited from weakened support for the NAACP, there was no evidence to suggest that the SELC set out to undermine the NAACP on purpose. 
The formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference shined a light on the influence of ministers and how they wielded that within the black community. Most African Americans, no matter their socioeconomic status, depended on either a white landlord or a white employer, and this made them vulnerable to retaliation. On the other hand, most black churches were owned and controlled by the black community themselves, and ministers were not subjected to the white power structure. This made them perfect point people for the civil rights movement. Black ministers had always functioned as leaders within the community, so progressing that leadership into the SELC or as one of their affiliates was a natural progression. Despite this, in the early years, the SELC struggled to gain a following in black churches and communities across the South. The fight for racial equality faced fierce repression from Southern whites. The SELC advocacy for boycotts and other forms of protest was also controversial amongst whites and blacks. Many black leaders believed that segregation should be challenged in the courts and direct action only resulted in white hostility and violence. The SELC's belief that churches should be involved in political activism was also deeply controversial. Many ministers and church leaders felt that the role of the church was to address the spiritual needs of their congregation and the social political activity of the SELC was against church principles. The SELC also ironically drew inspiration from the crusades of Billy Graham. He befriended Martin Luther King after King appeared at one of Graham's revivals in New York in 1957. While the pair had philosophical differences because of Graham's continued willingness to affiliate himself with white segregationists, despite this, the SELC and Billy Graham's evangelistic association had similar ambitions and Graham would privately continue to advise the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The Southern Christian Legion Conference continued and their first campaign was to crusade for citizenship which began in late 1957. The idea was developed at the Southern Christian Legion Conference 1957 conference. The campaign's objective was to register thousands of voters. The project was to double the amount of African American voters in the southern states in time for the 1958-1960 elections with an emphasis on educating prospective voters. It was initially organized by Ella Baker who sought to establish voter education clinics throughout the South raise awareness among African Americans about voting and how it could change the conditions of African Americans in the United States. While the Crusades did encourage discussion and action towards voter registration, it failed to meet the goal of creating a mass movement because of resistance in registering African Americans and because many blacks were reluctant and fearful to challenge their existing exclusion under Jim Crow. February 1st, 1960, four young black men who were students at North Carolina a and sat down at a lunch counter in Greensboro's F.W. Woolworth store and refused to leave until they were serviced. By February 8th, the sit-in protest had spread across Durham, Winston-Salem, and within two days, it had spread to Charlotte, Raleigh, Fayetteville, and Elizabeth City. By the end of the week, it had reached Norfolk and Portsmouth, Virginia, and Rock Hill, South Carolina, with almost no prompting from existing civil rights organization. This was a new stage of the black freedom struggle that had been launched. Martin Luther King's first direct action with the sit-ins was a phone call on February 8th to Durham's Douglas Moore, who had helped organize nonviolent protests outside of North Carolina. He wanted to convene in a meeting on February 16th to establish formal contacts between sit-in protesters from different cities in North Carolina. Although there was a lot of competition between civil rights organizations for the students of the sit-in in protests, many student leaders expressed a desire to keep the movement as student-led as possible. One of the more enthusiastic observers of the student protesters was Ella Baker. She knew that time and resources with the SELC was limited and when seeking to harness the momentum of the sit-in movement, Ella Baker invited students and said took part in those sit-ins to gather at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina in April of 1960. It was at these meetings that the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee was created and initially there was some talk about the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee working as an affiliate for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference or other civil rights organization, but Ella Baker encouraged the more than 200 students to remain autonomous. 1961, the SELC joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee in the Albany Campaign, which was a broad protest against segregation in Georgia. It was generally considered the SELC's first major nonviolent campaign. The Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee sent Charles Sherrod and Cordell Reagan to Albany in November of 1961 to help organize the black community. Black residents had been frustrated with the city's failure to address their grievances, so Sherrod and Reagan began to organize workshops around non 
nonviolent activities for Albany's African-American residents in anticipation of a showdown with the local government. In November 1st, 1961, when Interstate Commerce Commission banned racial segregation on interstate bus travels went into effect, Sherrod and Reagan saw this as an opportunity to test the segregation laws. They sent nine students from Albany College to conduct a sit-in at the bus terminal. None of the students were arrested and their actions inspired local leaders to join the movement. At the time, the Albany movement was considered unsuccessful for the most part. Despite large demonstrations, many arrests, the protests drew very little attention and most of Albany's public facilities remained segregated even after the LCLC's departure. Despite the lack of immediate returns, the success of the upcoming Birmingham campaign was attributed to the lessons learned in the Albany movement. By contrast, the Birmingham, Alabama campaign was a huge success. In April of 1964, King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference joined Reverend Shuttlesworth and the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights in their campaign. The campaign was more focused and centered around desegregation of Birmingham's downtown residents rather than total desegregation like Albany. The idea was to attack the city's segregation system by putting pressure on Birmingham's merchants during the Easter season, which was their second biggest shopping season of the year. April 3rd, 1963, the campaign launched mass meetings, sit-ins, and Marshall City Hall, the and the boycott of downtown merchants. King spoke to the black residents about nonviolence and their methods and appeal for volunteers. When Birmingham residents responded enthusiastically, the campaign's action expanded to kneel-ins at churches and sit-ins in libraries and a march on the county's courthouse to register voters. April 10, 1963, the city government obtained a state injunction against the protest. After debate, campaign leaders decided to disobey the court order. On April 12, 1963, King was arrested after violating the anti-protest injunction and was placed in solitary confinement. During this time, he wrote his famous letter from Birmingham jail in the margins of the Birmingham News. He would be released on bail April 20, 1963. May 2nd, 1963, more than a thousand black students attempt to march on downtown Birmingham. Hundreds were arrested. The next day, Public Safety Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor directed local police and fire departments to use force to halt the demonstrations. This is when images of children being blasted with high pressure hoses, clubbed by police officers and attacked by dogs appeared on television and newspapers sparking international outrage. Attorney General Robert Kenney sent Burke Marshall to negotiate between the black citizens and Birmingham city business leadership. On May 8, 1963, King and the other leaders agreed to call off further demonstrations during negotiation. And on May 10, 1963, Martin Luther King, Fred Shuttlesworth announced that an agreement had been reached with the city of Birmingham to desegregate lunch counters, restrooms, drinking fountains, and department store fittings rooms within 90 days and to hire blacks in store as salesmen and clerks and release hundreds of protesters on bond. After the Birmingham campaign, the SCLC called for massive protests to push for a new civil rights legislation that would outlaw segregation nationwide. At the same time, Philip A. Randolph, Bayard Rustin had issued a similar call for a march on Washington for jobs. On May 2nd, 1963, King, Randolph, Rustin met with James Farmer from CORE, John Lewis from the SNCC, Roy Wilkins from the NAACP, and Whitney Young from the Urban League to plan a united march. There were many competing ideas. Randolph and the Negro American Labor Council wanted to highlight the disproportionate poverty in black America, while the more militant wing of the movement led by the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee and the Congress of Racial Equality were disappointed with what they saw as Kennedy's lack of support for the civil rights legislation and saw it as an opportunity to put pressure on the administration. Kennedy himself feared that a mass demonstration would hurt the chances of getting a civil rights bill passed and put pressure on the NAACP executive secretary, Roy Wilkins, and the National Urban League chief, Whitney Young, to limit the marshal's objectives to support for a civil rights bill in Congress and nothing else. In the months leading up to the march, King, Wilkins, Young did everything they could to ensure that the speeches at the march would be more temperate in tone and moderate in their calls. In the push to make the march more respectable rather than offensive to the administration and white America, John Lewis of the SCNLC was forced to rewrite his original speech, which called Kennedy's administration's agenda on civil rights too little too late. Despite this, on August 28, 1963, the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom was a tremendous success. Over 250,000 people participated in the march without violence, and the protest culminated in a rally on the Lincoln Memorial where Martin Luther King would give his famous I have a dream speech, which articulated the hopes and dreams of the civil rights movement. 
Following the March on Washington, the SELC participated in the St. Augustine Movement, which was a series of civil rights protests that occurred in St. Augustine between 1963 and 1964. The St. Augustine branch of the NAACP was outraged that the city was using tax dollars to rigidly maintain segregated facilities and still discriminating against its black employees. Then civil rights protests were organized by Dr. Robert Hagling. Black citizens even attempted to try to enlist the help of then Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson when he toured St. Augustine. However, federal officials didn't respond favorably. By mid-June, St. Augustine record revealed black protesters' efforts to block federal funding for the city of St. Augustine. The protesters were then met with arrests and Ku Klux Klan violence. A local SELC affiliate appealed to King for assistance in the spring of 1964. The SELC sent staff to help organize and lead demonstrations and mobilize support for the St. Augustine movement. Hundreds were arrested at sit-ins, marches that opposed segregation, and many jails were filled with overflowing prisoners being led to outdoor stockades. June 11, 1964, Dr. King had come to St. Augustine in support of the protests. He would be arrested at the white-only Monsoon Motor Lodge and restaurant, which had become a central focus for the demonstrators. While in jail, King wrote from the St. Augustine jail to his friend, Rabbi Israel Dresner in New Jersey, urging him to recruit rabbis to come to St. Augustine to participate in the movement. June 18, 1964, three, 17 rabbis were arrested at the Monsoon Motor Lodge and the rabbis wrote their own manifesto called What We Want. Also on June 18, 1964, black and white protesters would jump in the Monsoon Motor Lodge pool. In response, hotel manager James Brock would pour acid into the pool to attempt to burn the protesters. Police would then arrest the protesters as they poured out of the pool. June 11, 1964, Florida Governor C. Ferris Bryant announced a biracial committee to restore interracial communication in St. Augustine. TV and newspaper reports of the struggle in St. Augustine helped build support for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. July 1st, 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act 1964 into law which prohibited racial segregation in public accommodations like the Monsoon Motor Lodge. Following the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference hoped to build momentum to win federal protection for a voting rights statute. Between 1961 and 1964, the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee had been leading voter registration drives in Selma, Alabama, a town with a consistent record of resistance against voting. After the SCLC had faced stiff resistance from the county law enforcement officials, Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference had persuaded local activists to come to Selma to make black voting a national concern. January and February of 1965, the SELC led a series of demonstrations on Dallas County, Alabama courthouse. February 18, 1965, Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot by an Alabama state trooper and died later in the hospital. In response, a protest from Selma to Montgomery was scheduled on March 7th. 600 marchers assembled in Selma for a march which was led by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. As they attempted to cross the Edmund Preachers Bridge, they found their way blocked by Alabama State Troopers and local police ordering them to turn around. When the protesters refused, the officers shot tear gas and waded through the crowd, beating the nonviolent protesters with billy clubs and hospitalizing 50 people. Bloody Sunday, as it would come to be called, was televised around the world. Martin Luther King called for civil rights protesters to come to Selma for a second march when members of Congress pressured him to restrain the march until a court order could rule on whether or not the protesters deserve federal protection. King found himself torn between requests for patience and demands of movement from activists who were pouring into Selma. King, still conflicted, led a second march on March 9th, but turned it around at the Edmund Peaches Bridge. King's actions only exacerbated the tensions between the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the more militant Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee, who were pushing for more radical tactics that would move from nonviolent protests to more active opposition to racist institutions. March 21st, after more protests and arrests and legal maneuvering, federal judge Frank M. Johnson ordered Alabama to allow the march to Montgomery. On March 25th, an estimated 25,000 protesters marched on the steps of Alabama Capitol in support of voting rights. 
August 6, 1965, Congress and Lyndon B. Johnson responded to the enormous amount of pressure generated by the Selma Voting Rights Movement by enacting the Voting Rights Act of 1965. While the march was successful, it also highlighted the pressures that King was under at the time between the movement radicalism and calls for restraint, as well as the growing tensions between the SELC and the SNCC. August 1965, after the Watts riot in Los Angeles, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference shifted its focus outside of the South into poverty in the urban areas. King was deeply convinced that the civil rights agenda required expansion of the Southern struggle into the North as it directly confronted nationwide issues of housing discrimination and inadequate education and jobs. In 1965, the Chicago Freedom Movement, which was led by Martin Luther King and James Bevel to systematically challenge segregation and discrimination in Chicago and its suburbs. During that time, Chicago was one of the most racially segregated cities in the nation, and through lending discrimination, intimidation, and violence, African Americans have been kept out predominantly white middle-class neighborhoods. Activists hope that by changing the laws and practices to allow for open housing, the ability of black homeowners to purchase houses in areas they could financially afford, that blacks could gain access to approved housing, better schools, and better job opportunities. By August 1966, Chicago Mayor Richard Diggley sought ways to end in the demonstrations. He started negotiating with King and an agreement was announced in August 26, 1966, in which Chicago Housing Authority promised to build public housing in predominantly white areas and the Mortgage and Bankers Association would make mortgages available regardless of race or neighborhood. But many viewed the campaign as a failure because of the SCNLC's lack of a base outside of the South, making it difficult to shift operations into northern areas. Late 1967, the Poor People's Campaign was launched to bridge the chasm between blacks and whites and address the continuing problem of poverty in the United States. King always wanted to bring the Poor People's Campaign to Washington, D.C., forcing politicians to see and think about their needs. He would state that we ought to come in mule carts and old trucks, and any kind of transportation people can get their hands on. People ought to come to Washington and sit down, if necessary, in the middle of the street and say, we are here. We we are poor. We don't have any money. You've made it this way. And we've come to stay until you do something about it. Although the effort of the Poor People's Campaign was overshadowed by the assassination of Martin Luther King, April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference efforts would mar it with widespread organizational confusion, despite the best efforts of now new president, Reverend Ralph Abernathy. The campaign almost collapsed on itself. While the Poor People's Campaign was on a much lower scale than the the March on Washington in 1963, with only an estimated 50,000 demonstrators and fell way short of its goal of significant anti-poverty legislation. It did, however, mark a change in the civil rights movement for advocating for a platform of only racial equality, but one of incorporating interracial class issues and economic goals. The organization's resources and staff shrank tremendously following the years after Martin Luther King's death. Internal tensions surrounding King's designated successor, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, as well as wider changes in the civil rights movement. The SNLC maintained its philosophy of nonviolent change, but having lost its founder, it ceased to mount these giant demonstrations and confined itself to smaller campaigns. The organization was significantly weakened by several other schisms like the departure of Reverend Jesse Jackson and his followers and all of these things contributed significantly to the Southern Christian Leadership Conference significant decline. While the SCLC received limited attention from history, mostly because it laid in the shadow of its leader and his dynamic personality, but the SCLC's greatest strength was his grassroots activism, which could not have been achieved without the amazing black leaders who led those local Southern Christian Leadership Conference affiliates. Today, Although not as influential as it was during Martha King's leadership, it's still active and headquartered in Atlanta. And the SCLC is a national organization with chapters and affiliates throughout the United States. It continues its commitment to nonviolent action to achieve social, economic, and political justice and focuses on racial profiling, police brutality, hate crimes, and discrimination. Thank you. This has been the story of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. If you'd like more stories like this, you can find more stories like this at OneMikeHistory.com. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so on Patreon page my Buy Me Coffee in the description below. Also, give us five stars on Apple Podcasts and support the YouTube channel. Peace.